Solve the puzzle. <laughs> don't say that. Yeah, Just put you it in know. the universe. All right, what's going on, Internet? We are live. I know if you're watching us on Facebook or uh, YouTube, it's going to take you some time. We got a lot of plus members pouring yeah. in here too. So yeah, if you're on YouTube or Facebook, you're on a bit of a delay here. Um, although it looks like we already have 45 people on there. Very nice. Guys, if you're in the plus chat, show us your face right now. All I can see is Christopher. I definitely want to see you guys. And see of course, David, Paula, Leslie. Leslie. What's happening, guys? David, what's up, dude? Good to see you, man. Leslie, show us your face. <laughs> Paula, <laughs> uh, whoever iPhone is, I'm guessing you're not going to be able to show God, us. It's your like face. our Slack meetings on Mondays. Uh, Scott's it's like, show me your face. <laughs> All right, if I must. Everybody on Facebook or YouTube, throw something in the chat. Just let us know you can hear us okay and that, that everything is working. If you've been with us for a while, you know that we've had our fair share of Facebook and YouTube <laughs> issues. So uh, hopefully not tonight. Um, we'll give it a couple more minutes here. we got people pouring in 39, 46, 52. We'll give it a few more minutes here. Um, what I'll do first, um, we've got a bunch of questions uh kent what's going on we've got a bunch of questions from our plus members so for those of you who've never Sweet. joined one of these before so once a month we hold these live trainings plus interactive trainings uh the reason if you can see i guess you can only see one of my monitors here but we've got all of our plus members on zoom here we can see their face they can see our face um at the end we open up the floor for questions you know where, where they can show us things they've got going on actually talk to us uh, if you're just hanging out on Facebook and YouTube, we appreciate you watching us. Hopefully we can get you inside the plus community inside the zooms, but you can still type some things in chat and it gets pretty busy and, and hard for us to keep up. So admittedly, these are really for our plus members. They are certainly going to take priority. Um, and as we're sort of going through stuff tonight, today is the last day of our doubles movement mastery course launch. So, um, I'm sure a lot of you guys have been seeing that content. If you're in our email list, you've definitely been seeing uh, all kinds of things about it. But um, tonight's curriculum, we're just going to give you a, a, a taster of some of the stuff that's in there, go into a little bit more detail. And uh, I'll throw a link here in chat for you guys. Um, it is still 75% off until midnight tonight. Plus members don't buy that. You already have access to that for free inside your plus account. Um, so that goes for you guys too. If you're thinking about, man, should I buy this course or join Player Core Plus? If you join Plus, um, you get this course and all the courses you've ever filmed. So That's right. check that out. I just threw that comment in there. You should see it on Facebook and YouTube um, and not on Periscope. If any of you are watching us on Periscope, <laughs> stop it. Um, I'm not even sure I know what that is. You're too old. It was it was like a thing for like 15 – it was a thing for like 15 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> All right, guys, we got plenty of people in here. We're up to 98 people between Facebook, YouTube, and we have got all kinds of plus members in here. Um, let's go ahead and get this party started. So again, purpose of tonight, we're going to talk about three massive doubles mistakes that Nate and I, we've been coaching for a while, and Nate's been coaching for a long while. And, it was like uh, a layup. Everyone saw it coming. I was like, you can't give yourself your own layup. You're not going to get through one live stream without me making fun of how much older Nate is than I am. It's awesome. Sorry, right, he's Tanner. <laughs> All right, so purpose for tonight, three sort of huge mistakes that we see that definitely hold you back. We go into way more detail on the course. If you want the course, check that out, but that's not what tonight is about. Um, the first one is actually based on before the point even starts. So if I may, I'm just going to go ahead and dive right in Come here and, and show you guys what's going on. So right out of the... It's getting warm. Dude. Yeah, all right. These hey. lights are like hey. beating me up here. Gosh, all right. <laughs> um. So the biggest mistake we make a lot of the times is before the point even starts. We're just starting in the wrong place based on what we've got going on in our game and bad things happen as a result. So I'm going to walk you through each of these four starting positions. And if you're thinking to yourself, man, that's me. I'm messing that up. Type it in the chat. Show us some love. Let us know that that's something you're struggling with. So let's talk about the server first. Um, how many of you guys type in the chat? How many of you guys have been taught that you're just supposed to sort of stand halfway between the center mark in the double sideline. Type in the chat yes if, if that's something that you've seen. So a lot of coaches, a lot of coaches offer this information. And it's not necessarily incorrect. There's just more to it that you can improve upon. So the best example I can give you is if we flip this scenario around. So if we've got 
a right-handed player like myself serving over here on the ad side. And I've got a really, really strong forehand and a really, really dumpy backhand. The last thing I want to do is stand dead center here and guarantee myself a cross-court backhand rally off of my serve, right? This is what I'm signing up for. If I stand dead smack in the middle, is a right-handed player on the ad side, and I don't hit a phenomenal serve, I've basically just signed up for a cross-court backhand rally. Type in the chat if that's not what you want, right? I feel you. I'm right-handed. I much prefer my inside-out forehand. So guess where I'm going to stand when I serve? And I'm not exaggerating. A lot of people don't even know this is allowed. I am going to stand all the way over here in the doubles alley. And that's going to look silly, and your opponents are going to look at you like, what on earth are you doing? And that's kind of the point. You're guaranteed now to be in an inside-out forehand rally. Uh, if you struggle with your backhand volley transitioning to the net, you're going to get more forehand volleys on your way in. So the moral of the story here is when you're trying to figure out where to stand before you serve, think about your strengths. Think about your weaknesses. What do you want to see back? If you want to see cross-court backhands, then great. You know, come back over here in the middle, and, and you'll get that cross-court backhand or rally. Or if you're a lefty. Yeah, if yeah, you're if you're, a lefty, or if you're a lefty. Yeah. yeah, and obviously the same thing um, is going to apply over here on the deuce side. I'm not going to move all these little guys around here, but if I was serving on the deuce side here – I would probably stand more directly in the middle of the court to guarantee a cross-court forehand rally because that is something that I want. So just think about what you've got going on in your specific game and adjust accordingly. So let's next talk about our partner up at the net. I'm taking the show here. I'm sorry. I'll, right I'll let you. I'll good. let you. Uh, good. Nate's not used to me coaching, so this is a nice break for him. Um, let's talk about when you're up at the net and your partner is serving. I think this is – a mistake that a lot of us make and we don't even realize how severe of a mistake it is. And I want to show you what's going on. So most of us stand and kind of hover close to the alley because we're real scared that Johnny is going to burn us down the line, right? And here's what I'll tell you. That is a concern if your partner serves the, whoa, <laughs> whoa. If your partner, why don't I move the tennis ball? Let's probably put it here. This is why we can't have nice things. If your partner serves out wide, then yes, now this guy has an angle to burn you down the line. But guess what? If your partner serves T, there is no angle from right here. As this player moves to cover this ball, there is no angle from here. First day of the new TV. There is no angle to get past you down the line here. So I really want you to shift more towards the middle of the court. And we're going to take this one step further. What I want you to think about here is if you just start in the middle of the box, this problem really solves itself, right? We just said that if your partner serves out wide, that this is a problem and we could get burned down the line. So start in the middle of the box. And if you see that, shift to cover your line. And now you're in position. But if you don't see that, and this is why a lot of us get stagnant up there at the net and never poach off our partner's serve. If you don't see that, if you see a ball more towards the body or more towards the tee, then I want you to start looking to poach. All right. Again, there's no angle to beat you down the line. It's very hard to redirect this ball back behind you. So anytime your partner is serving more towards the middle of the box or towards the tee, I want you to look to poach. And, and this is the big win here, really, right? Um, Got to erase my stuff here. You even know I can, that clutter, yeah. You know yeah. I can do that. I didn't know you? that was a thing, you know. Look at our fancy new TV. So I've got to get you guys to commit to this because it seems really scary, but it's actually the easiest improvement you can make. Think about this as a player returning serve. How many times are you feeling intimidated by a player that's standing in the middle and kind of like hovering around here, right? It's really, really intimidating. It's hard to get that ball across court. You make a lot of misses off of your return of serve because you're just freaking out that this guy's really active at the net. How comfortable are you when you play – terrified Tim that just stands in the alley. Look at all this real estate, right? Well, and if I can add to that, that's this is the problem. If, if you're trying to centralize your forehand and you want to play out here because you want to play your forehand, terrified Tim stands over here, That you can't do that anymore. Now we need to shift back right. because this ball is going to be uh, – I told you it would happen. It would happen. This ball is too obvious through the middle. Right. So then this person's position has to change. So by shifting and covering here, this enables us to play and centralize the forehand. Now, what I'll add on it on this is this position is much scarier 
to this player when you're hitting your forehand, all right? So obviously this person will be back or this person's forward because what's happening is when they're getting the forehand, you can create a whole lot more angle on your forehand with an inside out or an inside in forehand. If you're playing the ball off your backhand, what ends up happening is it's pretty obvious when you're taking the backhand down the line. You close your shoulders off, you're lined up, and this player is going to be able to predict it. But now if I'm moving to the left of center, what do I, how do I draw this with the marker? Can I just draw away? All right. So now my, my contact here is I'm swinging and I'm catching more of the – Oh, I gotta give you a pencil on it. Remind me. As you're yeah. catching more of the inside of the ball, right? Now you're working through your inside out. But that's really difficult for them to see, right? Because they don't know where your contact is. So they've got to kind of respect it. Because now if you shift a little bit and you start working behind the ball more, right? Now you've got your inside in and you can play to their alley. The disguise is what makes that really deceptive. The disguise doesn't exist on the backhand per se because they can see you. They can see exactly that the, the, the contact is a little bit more obvious to the opponent. So kind of it, it, to Scott's it, point. It all stems from this dude yes. camping out in the middle oh, of the dude. box. Yeah. Ter terrified Tim, is that what we're going on? Terrified Tim. Terrified T Tim. Timid, got a whole, timid Tim. Timid Tim. So yeah, I, that was a long spiel to basically say, look, it's okay to stand in the dead center of the box. Shift out wide when your partner serves out wide. You won't get burned on the line. You just got to pay attention. Your partner serves out wide, shift out wide. Your partner serves to your middle, look to hover and be aggressive up there at the net and poach. All right, so we've covered two of the positions. Let me get my razor out. Do, 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 do. Draw over my beautiful screen. All right, so position number three, and I think this is actually one of the easier ones to talk about. Let's get everybody back in the right place here. So we've got our server denoted by the ball there. Um, when you're returning serve. So not a very complicated situation. What I like to do is I like to take the pinky toe on my outside foot right here, and I like to line it up with the single sideline where it intersects with the baseline. So I'm right-handed. That has no relevance to which foot I'm talking about right now. I don't know why I told you that, but fun fact, I'm right-handed. You're going to, on the ad side, take your left foot, your outside pinky toe. You're going to place it where the baseline intersects the single sideline, and that's where you're going to start in the warm-up as a general guideline for where to stand. Now, if you're playing John Isner, <laughs> you're going to back up like somewhere in my yard over here, uh, and if you're playing Sally, the 2-5 beginner, you're going to move forward on that line. What I also want you to do, and this is a bonus piece of instruction for you here, is in the warm-up, pay attention. So many people are focused on them in the warm-up. Focus on what your opponent is doing. If every single serve they hit seems to be magically landing up the tee and they haven't shown you once that they can serve out wide, then I'm going to maybe start to shift over a little bit. If I see that they've got a humongous serve, that's when I would learn that, all right, maybe I need to step back a little bit. So as I'm returning serves in the warm-up, I'm actually practicing my split step. I'm figuring out where my feet are going to be as I return, and I'm gauging all that information to try and have a pretty good idea of exactly where I should be standing by the time the match starts. All right? And the last position, and by far, in my opinion, the most important because we get it wrong so often, and this is what leads to so many points just ending right out of the gates – when our partner is returning serve, so this is us right here up at the net, where we should be standing is back here close to the T, where a lot of us stand because I think we, can, we, we confuse the instruction we've heard from coaches about standing in the middle of this box here, is we'll stand in the middle of the box here, and here's what happens. And again, this is, we see, I would say, eight out of ten. This one's big. Yeah, of the three I mean, positions, this is probably the most important and the one that gets wrong the most. So and everyone's like, thinking offense, and they're not worried about defense. And it yeah. tees up the second big mistake that, that, that we see, which we talk about moving with the ball yeah. in a second. But here's what happens. So your opponents serve. Our goal, of course, is to get the ball past this net player. But let's say this person served at the tee like we just talked about. We've got to shift over to return the ball. If this player is no longer scared of their line. So if they've listened to this live stream, they're sitting in the middle of the box, and they're looking to hover – and while our partner has all of the intentions of getting this ball back past the net player, they don't. That ball comes right here, and this doesn't do it justice. 
but there is just a copious amount of wide open space for this net player to reflex if the right hand and a forehand volley into and without even without even thinking they're just sticking their racket out the ball is going to go here and the point is going to end it's back behind the net player there's no way to run this down it's going to be very difficult for this player to figure this out so again the correction here is to put yourself here now when this net player gets this ball Now when this net player gets this ball and they reflex it, it's in front of you and you can move forward to make a play on it. So now you're still in the point. All right. Is there anything you want to add to that? I know it's, I would it's just a basic say, concept. Once you hear it, you're like, oh, duh, that happens to me yeah, twice a game. Yeah, no, I, I think it's really important. I, I would just add that if you're in this position, it's dependent upon your skill level, right? So like if, if you're – your reflexes are a little bit slow, you might get more room and place your feet behind the service line. If you're watching the pros, they're, they're rarely that far back. They've got phenomenal reflexes. They'll stay they, through here. certainly adjusts based on how good you are up at the end and how, right. how quick your hands are, right? That's right. Yeah, for sure. But this cool. is a big one. And what I was going, I guess going back to what I was saying before, the reason players play the statue role, all right, and that's, that's where they're just holding this position. So the ball is going back and forth and this person isn't moving is because they're looking to be the aggressor. They're just offensive minded, right? But the problem is we'll get into this in a moment, but as you can see here, you're just giving up a ton of real estate and now your partner is having to defend the middle, the angles. They, they basically are controlling the entire L behind them in this part of the court yeah, because this player isn't in the correct position. Don't be lazy. Get in the right place. I'll make your partner do all the work. Facts. All right, so I'll give you a super quick recap, and this is sort of one of three major mistakes. We, we technically just covered four mini ones, so a little bonus. Um, I'm going to put us all back as if we're playing on the deuce side. So, again, when you're serving, I want you to think about your strengths and your weaknesses. Make a decision based on what you've got going on. Stand further out wide to protect something or to highlight something. Think about your game. What do you want to see on that return to serve? Start to set that up in your brain. When your partner is serving, I want you dead center in the middle of the service box. Don't get burned down the line. If your partner serves out wide, you just shift. No big deal. Whoops. You just shift. No big deal. If they serve up the tee, get involved. Poach. Look to hover and close this ball out. All right. Um, when you are returning serve, again, use your outside pinky toe. Line it up with the single sideline and the baseline in the warm-up judge what you've got on the other side of the net, check it out and see, are they blasting monster serves at you? If so, back up. If they're serving every single ball out wide, adjust. So you're going to make adjustments based on what you see, but this is the starting position and you're going to adjust based on what you see from there. And then finally, by far the most important piece, when your partner's returning serve, make sure you're protecting the tee for when that ball doesn't clear this net player and it comes back through the middle. Make sure you're in position here and not way over here, leaving all this open space. All right. So now that we've talked about what happens before the point even starts, yeah, it's good to meet uh, Let's 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 get into it. Let me erase an oh, that's not an eraser at all. <laughs> that was helpful. Let me erase and I'll let you uh, I'll let you get to party in here. I'll even put the tennis ball back down here for you. I appreciate it. All right. So here we're talking about following the ball, and and this is really important because. Just like what Scott was discussing with the role of the, of the player defending, we also want to talk about how we're moving to, to play offense as well. All right, so in this position, let's go ahead and set it up. Server, returning team, slide them just a bit and back. All right, and so what's going to happen here is, is we have two major roles. All right, and am I drawing? No, more. will you set me up for uh you know what I'm gonna do for you? You can slide it over. Boom! Look at that. Yeah, now I'm good. All right. So here we have the protector. Oh. <laughs> Everybody watch Nate struggle with technology. Type ha ha in the chat if you are enjoying watching Nate struggle. I'm sorry. I, I don't have to write that. <laughs> but this is the protector. What is what is this particular player protecting? It's protecting the middle. He or she is protecting the middle for the same reason that we just went over. All right. This player is the predator. They both started with P. I was just going to, I was like, that makes it confusing. I don't need to write this out there. But this player here 
is the predator, right? What do predators do, right? They're hunting, they're stalking, they're looking to do damage, they're looking to attack, all right? And it's really important that we understand these two roles when the point plays. I'm going to interrupt you yeah. because our man Richard is on live stream right now. Richard Billy. Oh, yeah. What's Richard, up, Richard? What's going on, man? How are you? I know you've been dealing with some injuries. Sorry, Richard's come down here and trained with us a bunch of times. He's like maybe my second favorite person on earth. I have to say second because I have a wife and she'd be pissed. Wait, I'm not. I'm not yeah, not you're, you're all in the top ten. Whatever. Richard, what's going on, man? Good to see you in here. Thanks Hope everything's good down there in South Carolina. Sorry, carry on. I just – that's my, that's I my dude, it. man. I Sorry. It. All right, carry on. All right, so we got the protector protecting middle, and we have the predator. Uh, eraser, that guy? Yep. I don't need all this. Sorry. Just distracting. All right. But so you can't stay in these two roles. So what you typically have, and you guys have all played with these players, you have this player that doesn't want to move forward, and they're protecting pretty much nothing. They're leaving their feet vulnerable, right? And, and they're just hoping the ball doesn't come their, this, their way. And then you have some people that are an all-time predator, and all they're doing is hoping to, to have – five putaways that they can talk about over a beer after the match. The roles have to change, right? So as this ball goes to the returner, the minute that this ball is hit and it goes by the predator, the roles have to change, right? So now what's going to happen? The predator becomes the protector, all right? The protector becomes the predator. Can I tell my college tennis story that makes this really easy to understand? If you want to offend everyone, yes. I do. In fact, I do. So I played tennis at the University of Maryland. Uh, grew up playing basically exclusively singles. So a lot of players in the same situation. A bunch of 18-year-olds show up to University of Maryland college practice. Not a lot of Americans. Um, but off a prolific junior career in singles. And so – He's trying to teach us doubles, our coach, and we're just like, we don't, we don't get this, you know. I, uh, I, I feel like there's too much standing around, you know. This isn't any fun. He's like, if you're standing around, you're doing it wrong. And so we walk out on court, and he has a streamer, um, like, I guess tacked. I don't know how he got this on the ball, but a streamer on every single ball. And so when he hit the ball, there was like a little tail on it that would like waggle, right? So as this ball goes back and forth, we're seeing this streamer following it, and he goes. I know you guys aren't very smart, but I'm assuming 18-year-old boys know how to chase tail, right? I know, crude, inappropriate, but it did work visually for us seeing this streamer and just understanding like, oh, if I'm up at the net and the ball goes this way, I just chase the tail on that ball from here to here. Oh, if it goes back, I just chase the tail back. And what we quickly realized as we played a couple points is there's really just two positions. Yeah we're trying to get back and forth from, right? It's back to that middle where we started when our partner is returning serve, and then as far wide as we need to be based on how far this ball goes out wide, right? If it's here, we only have to get to right here. If we get pulled really far out wide, we learn from when our partner serves out wide that we've got to keep shifting more to, to cover, cover the line. line. Yeah, man. So that's, if, if you're thinking, I've never been able to look at this and understand it, if you just think chase the yellow ball, chase the tail on the ball, you know, don't think about this. Just run after the ball. Um, you're always going to be in the right position at the right time. You don't even really need to understand why as long as you just do that. When the ball moves away from you, follow it in that direction. We call it follow the ball. Yeah. Sorry, I just completely took over. No, it's good. Your, your second and that's definitely – Erase my shenanigans. It's a, it's a good story, and, and I think some people appreciate it. Some people. <laughs> <laughs> rude and hurtful. <laughs> no, you told me that. That cracked me up. All right, so coming back to it, though – I just want to make this like super obvious, right? So like if once the ball, oops, let me get back to the ball. Let me just put it back in this situation. Again, predator, protector, this person is looking for offense. So if this person breaks down, if the person on the baseline breaks down and the ball gets coughed up to middle, the last place this person wants to be is here. Yeah, right? look at all that real estate. Man, you can drive an 18-wheeler through there, and yeah. you can get hit directly in the Well, and that's what I was saying. Plate. So yeah. it's like the middle, but then also what happens, like not everybody has great aim, and some people have really good aim. So either which way, you don't want this close proximity between your opponent. So here's the button. Here's the, the Justin the, McDaniel, if you're watching, this is how yeah, you get yeah. hit in the chest by me on a Wednesday night. <laughs> Justin's been doing a lot of hitting lately. But, uh, but so here's the cool part, too. All right, and this is what everyone confuses. The predator, right, the smother, a lot of different names for him or her. 
they don't move back until the ball is past, past them. them. All right. Or if it's just painfully obvious, like the ball is going way, way out here to the outer right. thirds, they're not looking to move back. Except if you move too early, you leave your line wide open, right? Right. And you're not yeah. really, you're not really following. But, but here's the thing that happens is like now the ball passes, this person shifts. This player is going to volley better. They're going to poach better because of forward mo mo momentum, right? right? They're going to be moving. And this place, they can cut. This forward momentum is going to allow them to cut in either direction. If you're standing still, what is it? Things things at, at rest tend to stay at rest. Things in motion tend to stay in motion. You want to be in motion. All right, so I know we're going to get this question, so I'll get in front of it. The pros don't do that, right? The Bryan brothers don't do that. Why? When, when in doubt, if you can do what the Bryan brothers do, don't watch these live streams. Yeah. Just do that. Just do yeah. That. This gets exhausting. This gets you can be the Bryan brothers. That, that's always the first piece of advice I would. <laughs> yeah. Same with Roger Federer. I mean, if, yeah. if you can get your foreign like Roger Federer, don't listen to our coach. Just yeah. do that. Be, be, be Roger. Yeah. All right. So the, the what we see at the pro level, the reason they don't do that is the ball is moving too fast. They don't have time to go back and forth, right? And even in, in some in, in, at advanced level, uh, to, to be perfectly honest, Scott and I don't do this entirely. We do a version of it, and that's what I'm going to show you now. I don't do it because I'm too fat and slow to move all that ground. Yeah. I'm not joking. <laughs> so and I've got reasonable hands, I guess, too. Yeah, yeah, it goes it goes along with it. And the ball's moving faster. So instead of coming back all the way, you're just gonna see a shift. I'm just gonna move them out of the way for a moment. That's much, much smaller. Okay. So we're we're going really from here. And then what you're seeing a lot of players do is they're actually moving circular, right? Almost I say circular. It's kind of circular. It's almost like a triangle, but they're clockwise. They're, they're, they're moving this way. Counterclockwise. Yeah. <laughs> I knew what you meant. All right. But so as the ball, let's see if I can get this coordinated. Can I add one thing? Yeah. So I just want to show you how important what you think is a very small shift actually is. Because remember, when this ball comes back here and your partner doesn't get past this net player, look at the difference between what this volleyer can do to you if you're here with all this space, even just two or three steps, every step you start to take in this direction, you're closing off that huge gap in the court. Yeah. So every every step matters here. We have players that we've coached that are in their mid 70s, 80s even, and they say, I can't move like this. And we say, every step counts. Every step helps yeah. close the gap. Check this out too. So like this is, this is I, I'm glad you made that point. So I go here, this person at the net, the predator, gets a layup, right? They have to make a calculated decision whether they're willing to pop you, yep. right? Like Maybe they will. But so ideally what you're hoping is that they decide they're not going to, and they're going to play the smaller part of the court. You want the ball going out there. It's a much, much more difficult shot. It's a much more small, it's much and smaller it's part of the territory. So you have a play on it. Yeah. If it's behind you, it's game over. Yeah. So if, if you are playing at a high level, you're not following all the way the ball back. Um, but here's the tricky part. If you're playing and you have a, a movement deficit, maybe bad knees, bad hips, whatever it is, you're not going to be able, unless the ball is maybe moving, you know, really. Oh, ah, you're doing so good. Unless the ball is moving really high, right? The ball is moving like this. You're going to have time. Um, but if you have a deficit with moving, you need to be focusing on the advanced movement. All right, and you've got to improve those hands. You're not going to be able to track back, but there's you can't be a statue. You're just going to cover less ground, and that's okay. Yeah, as the ball gets hit harder, things change a bit. So this answers the question that, that you fielded. Why don't the pros do this? Ball's moving too fast to possibly go from here to here to here to here to here. So I hope what you're thinking here at the rec level is, well, man, if I'm – let's steal this back if I may. If I'm a – if I'm this dude or dudette up at the net here, and as this ball is moving back and forth, so I've got to follow it, I've got to chase the tail. Oh my gosh, that's going to be a really long point. After about two or three points of this, I'm going to be like, I'm going to turn around and I'm going to yell at you. And I'm going to be like, hey, jerk that. face, come to the net, or I'm going to throw up on myself in the third game of this match, right? So, it's so important that you get to the net. That is the third sort of big thing we're going to discuss. Um, it's one thing to not be comfortable up at the net. Um, I'll go right back to my college tennis coach. I hated volleying as a junior in singles. Um, just didn't get much practice with it, right? Like I, I had a big flat forehand, 
most of the time if I was hitting a volley, it was just to put it away. It was a pretty simple shot. Mm -hmm. So I was just not that comfortable up at the net as a doubles player. And I said that to my coach, and he said, you are more comfortable up at the net as a doubles player than they are hitting past a 200-pound 6'3 man up at the net from the baseline. And, and I, you don't have to be a 6'3, 200-pound man to be very intimidating up here. The second this player gets up here to the net, the chance of this player making an error increases, I think it's by like 45%. I don't yeah. know if the data stays the same. Like I remember going to, to Vandermeer Tennis Academy as a junior, and he talked about Dennis Vandermeer, yeah. RIP, um, talked about how if you just walked up to the net, dropped your racket on the ground, you would win 40% of the points because yeah. this player is just going to freak That's out. The majority of the points are ended without the volley or having to hit a, a, a ball. And doubles – Probably not as much as singles because I think they're pretty used to volleyers being up there. But the point is, like, you're going to put a ton of pressure on them. Same right. baseline, you're letting people get their rhythm. Yep. One thing I'll remind you guys, because um, I'm seeing a lot of comments in here, and I, and I appreciate all the love in here. You guys saying great stuff, nice, love it. Um, <laughs> Richard says terrible T-shirts. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. <laughs> um, Craig says makes sense, bro. A lot of people saying yes, and we're pointing out these things. So. Um, everything we're coaching tonight, this is just a few chunks of what's in that doubles movement mastery course. So if you're in zoom on plus and you want to take like a deep dive, there's a full course called doubles movement mastery that you've already unlocked inside your plus dashboard. Go through that. We cover all this and way more, um, again, and I'll throw the link here on Facebook and YouTube for you guys. If you're interested, this thing is only $49 right now. We normally sell it a la carte for $199 or give it um, to our plus members. But the only way to get it is when we open it up like this, we're discounting it 75%. It's 49 bucks and we're throwing in a couple bonuses. So if you're liking this material, check that link out. Make sure you go grab that course um, or just join plus where you get access to this and all of our stuff. So we'll carry on here um, talking about we know now we've got to get to the net, right? Parties like, at the net, The man. parties at the net. I think we've made it abundantly clear that if you don't get to the net, ultimately your partner, if they're moving correctly, really should be quite frustrated with you after doing yeah. this off and on for a whole lot of time. So we're going to compromise on this live stream. We're going to say there's a couple situations. You don't always have to force yourself to the net, but there's a couple situations where you just got to come to the net and get this party started. And as coaches, we're, we're not – if you were – you know, training with us on a regular basis, we yeah. wouldn't we wouldn't let it slide. Don't, we would yell at you every single time you didn't get this right. Yeah, right? don't wait for the invite, right? It's like everybody's like, well, if they happen to – oh, God, sorry. <laughs> I think that's the racer. It's driving me nuts. Sorry, here you go. If, if I get the ball – if the ball is hit somewhere around here, thanks for the invite. I yep. guess I'll come in because you made me come in. But we don't want to wait for that. We want to make sure that, as Scott said, that we're looking for opportunities. Uh, Scott, you want to start us off here? Sure. So I think the theme is if you have time to get to the net, you should get to the net. All right. Whether you're a good volley or not, again, don't forget the second you show up up here, you're instantly 40% more likely to win the point instantly. I don't care how bad your volleys are. If you get up here at the right time, 40% of the time, it works every time. So. <laughs> <laughs> Was that an increment? <laughs> um, but so for real, if you have time, you need to force yourself up to the net. There's a couple obvious situations here. I'm going to go over just like the very most obvious. So we're back here. This is the player we're talking about. So you guys envision yourself back here on the deuce court. This is your opponent. You're in a cross court rally. Your opponent hits the ball to your net partner. Instead of just looking up there and be like, oh, I got a volley. That's cool. That's plenty of time for you to rush up to the net as soon as presumably this volley goes to the middle. If this player is, is not following the instruction of this live stream, the point will either end. But if this player is here, a lot of times you're going to see this volley come all the way back to this baseline player. And now look at this. 40% of the time we're going to win the point without doing anything. All right. So, again, if you have time, we want you to get to the net. The most obvious situation where you're going to have time is when the ball is not hit to you. You're on the baseline. They don't hit the ball to you. They hit it to your partner. Immediately come into the net. Good tennis is um, reactionary. Great tennis is anticipatory. I know I say this a ton. So good tennis would be I'm back here on the baseline. I see this ball move to my net player. As they make contact, I'm like, oh, my partner's volleying. Okay, cool. I'll get up to the net. This is good tennis, and we would be pretty pleased, honestly, with this, all the way up to even like a 4-0, maybe even lower level 4-5. Yeah. 
Like you would be winning a lot of points by just doing this. Great tennis, you want to play at that 5 level or higher is anticipatory. What that looks like is I'm paying a lot of attention back here to the ball after it comes off this opponent's strings. When I see that it's starting to head towards my volleyer, I'm actually all the way to the service line before they even make contact with this volley. But moral of the story is if you have time, come to the net. When the ball is hit to your partner up at the net, you've got that time, yeah. so get on up there. Can I add something to that? Yes, please. So, like, and, and that's, this is so important what Scott's saying because – as far as anticipation, what he's referring to is if you've received a, a, a weak ball and you're just ripping your forehand deep into the court, right? You could come in, you could come in there. What? Uh, PR, PLR, and Zeus says name this formation Tennis Panther. 40% of the time it works every time. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. I have ADD. And that made me laugh. Sorry. I know where we're at. We're good. All right. So, if you've ripped a big deep forehand, you could come in immediately off of that, all right? But if you see this person is redirected, maybe you, you didn't you know realize that from the visual cues, you're like, ah, oh, I did a little bit of damage. They're redirecting to my partner. Absolutely, you're, you're moving in, right? And that's what Scott's alluding to. Now, if your ball is short and you've moved the player up into the court four or five feet and they're now – ripping at your partner, you're probably not coming in, right? Like we get that, but that's what we mean as far as like, you have to- You gotta have apply this, common sense to these Well, and, but the anticipation of it, right? Like the anticipation is this person broke you down. They did something that made you hit short, right? So you're already anticipating we're in, deep, we're in trouble. I broke down short. No matter what happens, we're, we're in some trouble here, right? But if you've hit a good ball and you've moved this player back or whatever it might be, and you see that they've redirected to your partner, you should be coming in. I'm like, right. Yeah. Yeah. You want to go over another time where they've got time? When they have time? Yeah. So the, when, when do you have the most time in the court, right? So we know we have to follow our lobs. Yep. All of you out there, if you've taken clinics with your pros, you know you have to cover the lob. And the truth is – I can't wait for somebody – type this in the chat – uh, type these exact words if you say this to your coach ever. Because you all the time, well, I don't want to go to the net. I'll give you for the lob. Yeah. You're doing it wrong. And yeah. we're going to show you how to fix it right now. That's right. So here, this player has hit the lob. All right. So we know as this ball is moving back behind this player, this player has to switch. If they're good. Yeah. In a best case scenario for your opponents, they would land on the tee and their partner would go grab that ball, right? All right. Yep. So there's a switch here. And while this is occurring – he sits on the tennis ball. <laughs> well, this is occurring. You've got all the time in the world. Yep. Right. And so the problem is too many players hedge their bets and they're like, well, if it comes in short, I'll go here. Or they're the exact opposite. They're ever eager and they run in and then they get, sorry, I gotta get the ball out of the way. Then by being over eager, by over closing, it only takes them once or twice to get beat by the lob and they're like, coach, I'm never doing that again. That's a horrible idea. Like I'm not doing that. You locked your little homie there. Sorry. Is that what it was? Yeah. I'm going to get back in position. All right. So what do we want to do? All right. So we know that off this lob, the likelihood of this player hitting another lob, especially off the backhand. That's why lobbing on the deuce court makes a lot of sense. If the player over here is a righty, you're now lobbing, making the move to their backhand. When you're coming in, You've got to hover, and and a hover doesn't mean stop. What's nuts about this too? Sorry to interrupt you though. Yeah. Every single time we run, so we run doubles workshops here in Virginia Beach a couple times a year. Every single time we ask our students in this scenario, "Hey, you're here, and you just hit a lob over this player's head. This guy's running it down. What's going to come back?" One hundred percent of the time, every single person says a lob, and then those same people that know for a fact a lob is coming ran all the way up to right here as fast as they could and then complained to us that they don't want to come to the net because yeah. they always get beat by the lob. So again, take the information that you know, and you guys do know this. I think a lot of, a lot of um, improving your tennis game is actually just empowering you to take the information that you already have in your brain and use it in, in the heat of the moment. So you know a lob is coming. You're just not going to come in quite as far, and you're going to set up at the service line expecting an overhead. And think about it. It's going to be a lot easier if they dump it short to move forward to hit an overhead than it would be to try and backpedal 
to hit that same ball. We are all more comfortable moving forward, yeah. hitting overheads than we are having to back pedal back. And you're moving in and you're watching what's happening. You're looking at the duress of this player, right? Yeah. Like that's important. You're, you're moving in, you're getting all the visual cues. So what is this player doing, right? Too often we see this person cherry pick. If you play basketball, you know what I'm talking about. They're looking for instant offense, hero ball, and then the lob ends up going over them. They don't want to close in all the way because they should know that the lob is probably coming, but they do want to stay staggered, right? So this player's come in and hovered. They don't necessarily want to stay doubled hovered because then what ends up happening is if this player decides to pull it cross court, there's a little bit of room here that could be problematic, right? So they want to stagger just a bit, but that way if the lob, if the lob comes up, right, they can quickly drop back again or they can move in and put it away if it's a short lob. So yep. got to follow those lobs. The lobs are absolutely critical. That's a big one. For sure. Um, those are sort of the two biggest ones. Obviously, a third sort of the most obvious. If somebody hits the ball short, move forward and follow it in. There's one more time-related one that I want to throw here. There's these three. Again, if you were to work with us live on a regular basis, we would just not let you get away with this. Um, you would be forced by us as your coaches to come to the net if uh, if we saw this. So in a normal point, there's this cross-court rally going back and forth. If you've hit a ball really high and deep that bounces and pushes this opponent way off the baseline into the stands, you've got plenty of time to make your way up to the net here. Um, I'll also add as a piece of bonus information, what would you be expecting if you're this net player and this player's been pushed that far behind the baseline? probably a lob. So maybe you're not going to close in super, super tight here. You're going to watch their racket face and see what you see. But here's the other reason I want to provide some, uh, some comfort for you here. A lot of us are not comfortable coming to the net of this situation because we don't like to volley because we're scared when people hit the ball at us too hard, or we just feel like our hands and our reflexes aren't quick enough. The best part about coming to net in this scenario is think about it like this. If I took a tennis racket, and a tennis ball from right here and hit it at your face as hard as I could. That'd be terrifying, right? Yeah, I'm terrified you don't have a racket. It's horrible. <laughs> what if you stood 100 yards down the street and I did it? Is it still scary? I would laugh at you. It's not scary anymore. Well, guess what? That's what's happened in this situation. You push this person all the way back off the baseline. That creates a lot more distance between you and your opponent, which means you have a lot more time to react to a ball, even if they rip it as hard as they can. And better than that, you've got a ton of space with your eraser, you've got a ton of space over here to play the ball into for a pretty easy winner. So again, this is one of those situations, if you find that you've pushed your opponent way off the baseline, you've got the time that you need to sneak into the net. That is sort of the theme here. If you've got time, get up there to the net. So we've covered the three big mistakes. We've talked about the four mistakes oh, you wait, make I've before got, the, got, oh, hey, hey, bonus, bonus. Oh my gosh, he was just gonna, I'll erase. He wasn't gonna tell you about the dink and the duckum. Oh, Don't give away everything in this course. I'm just going to give a teeny tiny one. Right. A lot of you guys know I've, I've recently uh, switched over to a one-handed backhand due to an injury. A lot of you um, know because I'm famous. <laughs> yeah. No, I said not. Well, maybe I don't know. <laughs> a lot of you know because you've been right. so, following my social media. <laughs> but, but if you've got a one-hander out, out there, like, it can be tough coming over the ball. Now, in singles, it's, it's, it's much easier to manage. In doubles, it's tough. Right, if you're not coming over the ball and you got somebody net, they're, they're picking it off quite a bit. So the other time that we want to be looking to come to the net, and I'm going to show you from the ad core perspective because this is what I'm running into. All right, server is here. Well, I need setting this up. Type in the chat if you're hating Siri randomly activating. In the chat, if you're loving our new TV and our setup here, this is kudos to Ian Westerman at Essential Tennis. He started using this thing. And a lot of his videos, and I was like, Are "You cool if I copy that?" And he was like, "You, you definitely should." Yeah. So thanks, Ian. All right, so here's what we're running into. I'm running into right. Big serve coming out to the backhand. New backhand, having a hard time coming over it to where this player's not getting involved. All right, so the option that you can play here, chip it and play it short. All right, but so what we're talking about the dink and dunk him is like now. We know this player is moving in. If you've hit it really well and you've caught them off guard, there should be a visual cue. Can show them the visual cue? Yeah. Oh, a reach, yeah. right? Yeah. So, like, the face is open, right? Probably palm up. 
Palma up on the on it. And at that point, like you've moved in and you're looking to intercept the ball. And that's the dunk. Like the ball comes back to you and you're punching it middle or maybe you're punching towards the feet. And think about that. If you see open strings, there's no strings in this racket, but if you see an open racket face, where's that ball going? Up. There's where the dunk comes in because you're going to pop down yeah. on top of them as you close into the net. You don't want to close in too tight, though, because you could could have been a lob situation. That's right. right. That's right. And so even if this player isn't under a ton of duress, if you've kept it low, they've got to clear the net. So they've got to lift that ball. And as they're lifting, you're looking to meet it. And it, it kind of turns in for you pickleball fans. That's where you kind of see these situations in tennis. Short chip, they come in, they have to dig it out with the chip. And now their responsibility is to try to play it at your feet or around you, right? But going from a return of serve or a defensive situation to suddenly being a neutral offense, that's a pretty good situation. For sure. Right? So that's the other one about getting to the net. When should you come to the net? If you draw this person in with a short chip, follow it because you know what's probably going to happen if you stay back? They're going to go, that was a pretty good short chip. What do, you, short chip. You know, what do you think of my short chip? And, and your partner's going to be stuck covering, and then you're going to be in a full on scramble that's going to get really funky. That's right. That's a good bonus tip. I like it. Yeah. To dink them and dunk them. All right, guys. We're going to open up the floor for some questions here. Again, if you're liking this stuff, grab the course 75% off. I threw the link in the chat. It expires at midnight tonight, and then only our plus members can get it, or you're going to pay 200 for the thing. So check that out. Um, I'll throw a couple shout outs to you guys. Guys, there is 198 people watching us on Facebook and YouTube and commenting and Very saying cool. hi. So, of course, we're going to have to prioritize uh, the questions that come in from our plus members. We do see you, um, Kent, Sour Patch Kid, Paul, Holly, Kent, Howard Fisher, Paul, Amy, uh, Brian, says poor Nate when I was making fun of you, uh, Vig, <laughs> Vig, Richard, Arthur. Craig, Frederick, we see all you guys. I, I promise we're not ignoring you, and I will try and get to some of these questions in here. But this is for our Plus members. So, guys, um, on our Plus Zoom, I will tag you in here. Uh, I think most of you did our serve challenge and were VIP members there, so you've got a pretty good idea of how this works. But I will call on you um, as we go through the questions here. Let's say I see you're unable to turn your camera on. That's okay. We still love you. Um, Christopher, I'm going to unmute you, my man, or ask you to unmute. Muted. What's going on, man? How are you? How's your night going? Oh, fantastic. Be well, guys. Remind Thank us you. where you're, uh, where you're talking to us from again. Um, Long Island. New Long York. Island. Very, very cool. So you had a, a question here or a turn down the line is a very low percentage shot. You're going over a high part of the net. There's very little court to it into, so I guess that wasn't uh, wasn't really a question as much as a, uh, a statement we agree with. I can, I can throw a question at you now if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let me show you a situation I kind of run, run into. I'm left-handed if I'm returning from the head court, okay? Yes, yeah, so I'm just getting, and getting it all so you Oftentimes, got... the serve goes to my backhand. Oh, right. Excuse me, I'm returning from the deuce court. I'm so sorry. I'm returning from the deuce court. Um yeah. Serve goes to my backhand, which is completely, completely fine with me. But here's the deal. You said you're lefty, right? Yeah, I'm lefty. So it's going to my backhand. It's pulling me into the hour, mm -hmm. which I'm good with. But I have so little room to get into. The angle's kind of taken away from me. Okay? Right. I can drive the ball fairly well, but when you've got a right-hander there at the uh, returner's partner, He's in a great position to poach. Right. Give me some advice of what I can do with my return. To, I don't know how I can avoid this situation. So I'll repeat the question uh, just so that everybody that's watching on Facebook and YouTube can hear us. Um, we've got a left-handed player returning on the deuce side of the court. When you get pulled out wide, you've got the backhand. Um, you've got the option to go down the line, but you're basically just sort of feeling trapped over here, right? You don't really feel like you've got a great cross court short angle ball, or that's pretty pretty much it. My backhand kind of goes right into the right hander's forehand over the middle of the net. Right. It so it's in a great poaching situation. Safe to say, the doubles partners I play with aren't as intelligent as you guys. No matter how many times I tell them, they live in the alley. They live in the alley. That's kind and of. And I yeah. say, look, you've got to go towards the middle because if he intercepts coaches on my yes. my backhand, 
the coach is going to go right through the middle of the court. Right. Got it, man. I'll, I'll give you a couple of things. One is going to sound sort of weird and reckless. Take the first return of the match and rip it down the line as hard as you can. Um, okay. Everybody looks at me like, well, that doesn't solve anything. I'll tell you what it solves. Right out of the gates, it sets a tone where this player is going to immediately start to sort of be like, oh, man, all right. <laughs> Even if you miss, it just sort of sets the tone like, hey, buddy, like I've got this, and, and you better camp out in that Alex. I'm going there all day long. So you can set the tone very early on in the match to sort of establish a position where you're not actually in as much trouble here if you can convince this player to shift. What I will tell you is if they don't shift, if they're starting in the middle and they don't shift, you should burn them down the line, right? You should hit down the line. And if they're not shifting correctly, you should have a decent amount of space to actually do it as well. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I mean, other than that, of course, high and cross court, higher over the net, the bigger the angle you can generate is obviously the goal. Lobbing over this player's head, particularly if they're right-handed, is a backhand volley. You call that what, top shelf? Yeah. We have a strategy called top shelf, basically, where you're looking at a right-handed player up at the net. Nobody likes a high backhand volley. So you don't have to hit a super strong return to plop this sort of right where it is and force them to hit a high backhand volley. If you're in trouble, that's a great bailout solution. How do you like your, your chip? Do you feel pretty confident with your chip? Um, it's there, but I've... I love I love to drive drive the top spin back yeah. or to drive through the ball. The backhand has always been my best stroke since day one. Sure, sure. So I'm super confident hitting it, and that's usually my, it's kind of my go-to shot. But I have learned since I've played more doubles over the years. Yeah, to, if I chip that return, it gives me more of an angle to go into. Yeah. Right. So what what I would advise you we want you driving your backhand. Right, like yeah. that's your weapon. It's what you want to be doing. By getting a chip lob up high to this player, it's going to make your backhand better, your drive backhand. Because what you're ultimately doing, the top shelf, we're not worried about hitting a lob winner. All we're trying to do is get them stretching up with the backhand. But what it's going to make this person do is start playing off the net more. And so as soon right. as they play off the net a little bit, now you get to drive back through the low part of the net. But if you don't get them moving – back if you don't get them to change position they're going to continue to camp out they're going to be they're going to know that you don't particularly like this shot and they're going to continue to infringe the middle so make them respect that position get them to take a step back then play through the middle now if you've got somebody that's just extremely good with the hands your lob is off maybe let's say it's a winning night you just cannot get this thing going oops you cannot get this thing going up into the wind it's just one of those nights Instead of trying to pass, play into their hips, all right? And it, because it's their decision. If they're going to camp out, if they're going to play this tight up on the net, they've made that decision. But too often, I feel like what we try to do is that we try to lay something, you know, like you're going to go like a banana shot, like Rafa. Just play into the hips because yeah. that's going to make nobody it likes this ball. No, mm -hmm. and they can't hurt you. They're going to have to reflex that ball back. And what I would do is, as you play that ball into the hips, I would start moving in. All right, look for that little, you know, weak volley that may dump short. Probably in summary, I know we're throwing a lot of stuff at you. In summary, I would just take a long gander at what this player is doing uh, before the point starts, right? You see this player is really far off the net. I know I have the option to dip it at their feet. If I see that this player is really tight up on the net but not doing a good job of shifting when my opponent serves out wide, I've got that option of lacing it down the line, which we, we know is a lower percentage, but maybe a better option would be to go high comfortably to that backhand volley. So a lot of this is going to depend on not just you, but what you're seeing this guy up at the net doing, right? Is that helpful? Right. Right. Cool. All right, man. Thanks, well, stuff, guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thanks for Appreciate joining. You. Hanging out with us tonight. All right. We'll move on here to David. David, let me ask you to unmute my man. Can you so hear us guys, okay? What's going David, on, man? What's going on? Happy hump day. Yeah. Wait. Wait, it's Tuesday. It's Tuesday. <laughs> Happy day before hump day. <laughs> wow. Apparently, I'm living on a Wednesday. Oh, I remember my first live stream. <laughs> <laughs> the internet, it's very nerve-wracking. Um, so you and, asked, you're, and you're the one that makes fun of Nate all the time. I know. It's because it's, it's yeah, I'm very insecure on the Thanks, internet, David. so I've got to direct my insecurities at Nate. Um, all right, so you had asked a question. I definitely want to address this first one that you put in, in the chat here on Zoom. Um, does the 40% of the time being at the net also apply to singles play 
Curious if that math works out the same. Definitively, no. Um, you've got to cover a lot more space as one person up at the net covering the entire singles court is two people covering the entire doubles court. And when you introduce a second person, you can cover angles by hovering and smothering that you can't cover when you're just one person. So in singles, um, you know, the majority of the time, hopefully you're doing damage before you're coming in or chipping and charging or, yeah. you know, the, the same logic applies where you coming up to the net certainly forces that baseline player to try to hit it past you. And, and it will lead to more errors, particularly at the rec level. But uh, I would not say it's it's as much of a freebie as it is in doubles. The uh, I didn't miss the first part. He was serve plus one, right? Oh, he was just saying. So remember when I was saying that when this player in doubles comes up to the net, just forty percent of the time, this baseline player is going to yeah, miss. Yeah, okay, okay. He's Sorry, just I missed saying the first part of it. Hey, no, you're cool. Got it. Um, and then I'll read this one out loud. Uh, with the positioning in doubles on the serve, should you add more spin based on the angles you can create with different starting positions, or stick to your normal flat serve? Seems like if you have to stand closer towards the alley to protect your weaker side on the return, then a T serve has less value. Let me, can I grab this? Sure. All right. So there's, unless you're playing with somebody that just has a really good high percentage flat ball or a, a big first serve, I feel like going for the big serve is one of the gr most greedy things you can do as a doubles player, yep. right? Like we're playing as a team. If Scott and I are at a team, his job is to get me involved, right? So if he's ultimately serving his first serve down at 30 or 40 percent, He's hitting a ton of second serves, and I'm not doing anything. I can't help because what can we do on a second serve, right? Um, and Scott's got a pretty good second serve, but it's still not the same. It's the nicest so, thing anyone's ever said about my second serve. It's not that good. I was trying to be nice. We're <laughs> it's not, really not. It's not very good. <laughs> it's awful. But it's uh, <laughs> but so anyway, so th the problem is that we want to be spot serving, right? And so we were going to talk about this earlier. This is a great time to talk about it. These two players between points – should be communicating, all right? <laughs> That's them communicating. You don't have to stand like this next to each other either. That's just yeah. for the purpose of this video. So the idea here is if they've said, hey, serve T, this guy's backhand, he can't redirect, I'm going to look to poach, right? Or if this guy, as we were just telling uh, our, our friend a moment ago, if their tendency is to lob, right? they may know that they're quickly going to look for it and they may drop back a little bit to look for that overhead. So this is all happening with high percentage plays, right? Like kicking to the T, even the slice wide, right? Like I, you'll hear coaches say, yeah, you shouldn't play out wide because this player can't do anything. Disagree. Not if you have a good slice because if the ball stays really low, they have to clear the net. So yeah, you can't immediately run over here You've got to hold position, let them know that the alley shut down, and then as the ball is approaching, move middle and shut that down to the middle, right? But the the flat serve, yeah. If you're if you're trying to hit it, you're trying to win the game by yourself, and it's 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 a double. It's two people. I'll introduce another idea here too, and this is going to sound a little mean. Your net play, like you don't always get to choose who you play doubles with. I'm sure some of the leagues you play in, maybe you're you're mixing and matching or just for fun, you know, periodically. You don't always have control over who your partner is. Maybe your partner sucks at volleying, right? And you don't want them to get involved. So That's what? Not nice. it's not very nice, but it is true. If I've got a huge forehand, right-handed player, I've got a huge forehand, and my partner has got some dumpster fire volleys, I'm not going to serve up the tee and into the body. I'm going to serve out wide, and I even maybe during that communication, be like, hey, I'm serving out wide, cover your line. Because yeah. I just want to get you out of my way. So I can get in this cross court forehand rally, and that is a perfectly good strategy if you've got stronger ground strokes than this guy or gal, right? Like you're going to overpower them, make your way to the net. That's a very viable way to win. We always talk about like, oh, I want to get our net player involved. Not always, right? So keep that in mind as well. You know, based on what you want to actually happen, based on the partner you get up there at the net, you may not want to serve up the tee and, and up to into the body as often. So. I'm always the, the I'm guy. I only that, made you stand in the alley. <laughs> I'm always I'm always the guy that delivers like the really rude information. Nate Nate keeps a PG, but yeah, I mean, um, you determine what you get back here. If you serve out wide, it's it's how you can get your partner out of the way and get in that cross court forehand rally if that's what you want. Gotcha. I will continue to uh, uh, work on the 
be an intimidating six foot five guy at the net. It's my, it's <laughs> yeah, my favorite I, I, be a monster. Of I just saw your uh, your your message here. There are those who call me Tim. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Don't be terrified, Tim. Up there, a lot of it is just is just moving around. Honestly, if you can get up here and understand this, following the ball back and forth, understand that when your partner is serving more towards the tee and middle, that you can get more and more involved and just sort of peek into the other side of the court here, get this this baseline player thinking you'll you'll win a lot more points up there at the hey, Let me just uh, some real, just to clarify, a flat serve to keep them honest is fantastic. Right? Like if this player is like encroaching because they're defending the big top spin of their backhand, then serve up the gut, right? Give yourself a really high percentage serve to where you get them to respect the position. What I'm honest, what I'm referring to is like when this person is like I'm going to try to hit an ace, right? It's like, you don't need to do that. Just yep. pitch it up the middle, get them to back up. So then that you can then impart the spin and you know, pick your spots. That's a good point. So I think that's, I think that's really helpful just in terms of the thought process of don't think hit the, hit the T-star flat to try to win the point. Should I say, if I'm going to hit the T-star flat, I'm going to tell my partner to try to poach on the next ball. Cause I think they're going to get a weak reply back as opposed to, you know, hitting an ace. Um, yeah, yeah, and you've so trained the opponent now to respect that serve so that they then maybe back up, and that'll make your top spin or your slider more effective. That's You're right. winning the battle of positioning. That's everything that we're trying to do in dubs. That's right. All right, David, thanks for, for, for tuning in, man. Good seeing you, man. Yeah. All right, we did have – um actually a fair amount of plus submission so if you're a plus member you can submit questions before the call just in case you can't make it because the recording of this also lives inside your plus dashboard so i'm just going to run through a couple of these rocco from is that binghamton binghamton new york yeah rocco, um, rocco uh, sent me some video analysis as well. oh, nice yeah okay so Good he asks rocco. i don't rocco i don't see you i guess you could be uh iphone uh i don't think you're in in here but we'll answer this quickly for you um how do you decide what type of return to make slice blocks topspin etc do you decide before the serve is in progress or do you react so idea is basically you're back here on the baseline you don't know what's coming yet mm -hmm. so i think you kind of just answered your own question there a little bit if you don't know what's coming there's not really a way to know if you're going to hit a driving ripping forehand or or a lunge you know backspin lob so yeah. for me i have a general idea as the match wears on as i'm starting to identify patterns of where my opponent serves but um but in general, it is reactionary. You yeah, it's, to add to that. it's just time, right? Yep. It's like time is the answer there. Yep. If you have time, right, work, drive through it. Yeah. Right? Not with a big swing either, but to like drive through it. Yeah, like you can you have a have game time, plan. That, yeah. Like you can have a game plan. Like I'm going to do this with this if this comes. Yeah. But but yeah, a lot of it, Rocco's so got to be reactionary. Like I say with Mike Tyson, right? Yeah. Everybody's got a plan until you get punched in the face. Yeah. So it's exactly. like if suddenly you're like, I'm going to rip this ball, and the dude drops a hundred mile per hour serve. You're probably going to be chipping. Right. That's right. <laughs> All right. A couple more here. Laurie from OKC. Uh, she says, I am a 4-5 woman, and I play 9-0 mixed doubles. Nice. What is the best way to neutralize the 4-5 or 5-0 man on the other side when I return his serve or serve to him? So effectively, Laurie is back here. She's playing a mixed match. She's serving to a 4-5 or 5-0 male or returning, right? So basically she's on this cross court rally and she's trying to figure out a way to diffuse what it sounds like. Um, again, Laurie's not live right now, but I assume um, if she's a four or five playing against a five O male is, is probably an overwhelming ball, right? Yeah. Like I know for, for me as a five O male playing against a five, five male would sometimes be an overwhelming ball. So diffusing this situation, I, I think the goal is to probably try and get this net player involved for as sure. much as humanly what possible. What I coach, and I, I'm, I'm, I work with this situation a lot. Um, I, I work with, uh, I work, gosh, maybe five years ago, six years ago, uh, a four or five uh, ladies team that went to nationals, had a good run, and they were all playing mixed doubles right after that. They were in a combo league. And this is what we talked about a lot. It's going to be really hard to win this rally with this gentleman. So what you want to do is you want to draw – her in right and so by, by drawing her in what we mean is like you're not playing to her you're playing balls that she should be hitting right but if she elects not to you're at least moving the four or five man to the middle of the court to his back end and this activates your your four or five partner your five oh partner right they become more activated 
But what you really hope here is like maybe you threw in some like low slice and, and kind of this, bait him into getting involved. Yeah, right? and she's yeah. like, oh, that's I'm right there. You just want her to put a racket on it, likely gonna pop up, your partner cleans up, right? Or you move in and you be the aggressor. But that's what we work on. We work on drawing in the weaker player. And if they shrink and they go, oh, I'm not falling for that. Well, now now the four, five, five oh guy, he's got all this court he's gotta cover, which makes it a whole lot more easy for you and your partner to uh to be effective. That's right. Laura from OKC, I hope that helps. I've got a couple more here. Uh, Lynn from Maryland. When playing doubles, <laughs> Jessica Flag says, my partner always stinks at volleying. The worst. <laughs> what up, Jess? Going she on, must Jess? be playing with Dave. That's, that's right. Oh. oh, sick burn. Dave and Jess are good friends. Just, uh, just Dave. All right, so when playing doubles and your opponents are one up, one back, and the one back covers the court very well, what do you do? And your partner stays back. You stay up at the service line and become the target. What in the world do you do? So we'll, we'll address these uh, one at a time. So the first question is you're playing doubles, one up, one back, uh, in the situation we've been talking about all night long, right? And basically, uh, Lynn from Maryland is just sort of saying that this player is pretty good. And, like, they're not really having an issue. They're getting this ball back every single time. We're not winning ground stroke points. I think we go back to one of the rules from tonight, and you look for any way you can to get to the net. You try and get this ball deeper in the court to back this player up off the baseline. Anytime your partner gets a volley, you're going to sneak to the net, or you can deploy Nate's tip of the dink em and dunk em, where you can pull this person up to the net, and when you see them reach, that's going to give you the opportunity to come in and close that ball out. I don't know that you could do a better job of answering that question than I just did. Do you have yeah. anything you could no, possibly I mean, add? And there's nothing about it, this person being exploited, right? Right. They're not being exploited. It's just no. they're losing ground circle. Yeah, they're just, just getting this ground circle. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've, got, chips, you've got a lot lobs, of options. Yeah. All that good stuff. Out of the backhand side over here is an option. Um, Lynn, hopefully that helps. Oh, sorry. And, and so here's the other one. If your partner stays back and you step at the service line and become the target, what in the world do you do? So exact same situation, but you're this player now up at the net, and your partner just won't come into the net because they didn't come to this live stream and didn't realize how important yeah. it is. This is actually a tougher question. You want to feel this one? So yes. It's hard. So I don't know. Do you do I know there's terrified. Up some here? people will be like, "No, that's that's not doubles." Do this. Oof, controversial. Yeah. All right, and I don't, even if you're serving, why not? Right. If if this player is a sitting duck. We know two Swedish this, dudes that won many, many Division One college exactly, titles right? playing too bad. So, so Division One, extremely talented uh, collegiate players, our good buddies, they they were very successful doing this over and over again, right? And and they were doing this off the serve, not often, not all the time, but if they ran into a big gun over here and all, they, they would play double back. Because what it does is it takes away the easy target, right, with this person being up that inevitably is getting attacked. And it makes this person try new things, right. right? So as they're moving the ball around and they just get creative, maybe they want to try a drop shot. And right? they're not going to stay back here forever, too. I think that's the thing that really we need to like yeah. drive home. Everybody just assumes this is wrong. We're not saying you're just going to camp out back here. We're just saying you're going to wait for the right opportunity to come to the net versus just being forced to stand here and get annihilated yeah. out of the gates. I'm eventually right? going to get killed. Right? Right. It's yeah. like if I've a got a dumpster second serve and we're playing – you know, the best college doubles team in the world, every second serve, this guy's hitting Nate in the throat of mine, right? So, like, Nate eventually is going to be like, Scott, your second serve sucks. I'm going to come back here. <laughs> I'm going to come back here and work our way into the point until I find that transition to get back up here. So don't feel like this is admitting defeat. It's just re uh, restructuring some things to get your way to the point a different yeah. way. Um, all right. So, Lynn, hopefully that helps. Um, Thanks for the question, Lynn. Oh, man. I'm going to try and not take 45 minutes to respond to this. All right, so Mandy H. from Tennessee says, how can I better anticipate poachable balls at the net? I'm going to quickly, quickly go oh, for yes. this. Um, go for it, buddy. So a lot of it is what we actually just covered. So hopefully you saw this whole video and you're, and you're looking at this in your plus dashboard later on. But a lot of it is just being in the right position, right? So – a lot of players that we run into, 3 0, 3 5, even 4 0s, that say, I struggle with poaching, never were taught this chase the ball or follow the ball drill. And so what happens is they just get stuck way too close to the alley, and this is just too great of a distance to poach. Or 
they, you know, they're shifting to the wrong spots. They're just not in that circular movement that Nate was talking about. That's going to put them in position to poach. So step one would be if you're not already make sure when this ball is moving cross court, that you're following it as this ball moves back towards the baseline player. Again, you're following it back towards the net as the ball passes you, you're coming back to the T as you continue this movement and continue following the ball you're going to be in the correct position to be able to poach. No, so now from here, what I want you to think about is as you shift back to the net, a lot of players are going to lean towards the doubles alley and shift this direction with sort of a subconscious mindset of, okay, I'm going to cover the line still. What I need you to do is square your weight on both feet here. Balls that come here are just as much yours as balls that come here. So to put it. with that mindset, now you look and see how much court you're actually covering over here. And this has put you in the right mindset to be more successful to poach. Now I'm going to give you a little bonus tip here, something I call the sneaky poach. Um, and we talk about this again inside this doubles movement mastery course that, uh, that quadruples in price at midnight. What is going from 49 to 199? Oh no, why don't you prom solve it? <laughs> rude um the sneaky push looks like this um and this works particularly well if you're playing against somebody wearing a hat or a visor so the sneaky push is this i'm going to sell to my opponent ball's been hit over here to my opponent at the baseline i am going to sell to my opponent i'm going to dance around over here hey no worries you've got all this space i'm just going to cover my line there's nothing for you to be stressed about right so the last thing they saw before they dropped their eyes to make contact with that forehand is me standing close enough to the alley where they know they're not going to go there and they feel very comfortable that they've got lots of space in the middle to hit. The second their eyes drop, and this is the visual cue I want you to look for, if they're wearing a hat or a visor, second that hat or their visor covers their eyes, if my eyes can't see you, so, I'm sorry, if you can't see my eyes, my eyes can't see you. So the second those eyes drop under that hat or visor, I want you to just commit and take off. All right, so that's the biggest anticipation trick that we work with on rec level players that are scared to poach that just works instantly. So playing somebody with a hat or visor, obviously if they're not wearing a hat or visor, the same rule applies. As their eyes drop to the ball, they're barely going to see with their peripherals. The last thing they're going to see as they make contact is you charging. A lot of times you'll just get a free point because they're going to freak out and see you. Um, and a lot of times you're, you're going to end up just in a great spot here to sneaky poach this ball right to the middle of the court. I'm just going to add three words. Your ABCs always be closing. Always be closing. Right? Scott drew it perfectly on the court. When you're moving, you're always, always be closing. You're always moving and looking to go diagonal. So if I'm in this player and I'm poaching, I should be moving to the net strap. All right. If I'm trying to intercept a ball laterally, that's not closing. Right. So if I'm, if I'm on the backhand side, I'm moving towards that net, that post. Not this way, but here and here. Yep. Always be closing. Always be closing. So. ABCs. All right. Last, um, the last question from our plusers that have submitted ahead of the call, and then uh, you up for maybe like five, ten minutes. We'll, we'll hey, field man. some off of Facebook I'm and good. YouTube. I appreciate you guys sticking me. around. Yeah, I mean, look, we've, we've been on here for an hour and fifteen minutes. There's still eighty-eight of you guys watching us on Facebook and YouTube. And still a lot of our plus members hanging out in here as Thanks well. Thanks for being here, guys. It's very cool. I mean, like – Yeah, this is no fun if nobody night, shows up. Tuesday, yeah, yeah. people are hanging out. Appreciate this is it. cool. All right, so the last one, and this is – where does uh, Michael Jordan live? Say that word. Lancaster. Nope. Lancaster. How do you say it? Lancaster. Lan when I Lincoln. read it, it's Lancaster, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. But every time I say it to him, it's like it's Lancaster. He says it's uh, – just anyway – um, if you speak English, Mike Edwards from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, there I think, go. um, uh, I'm going to field this directly to you cause you're really good at this. So what is our, your techniques to use the breath to retain a high level of muscle efficiency and stamina, any other teachings on the breath in tennis? So the idea is just breathing. How do you control your breathing to get the most out of your tennis game? I'm just going to say one thing yeah. and then I'm going to let you add to it. Cause I know you're sort of an expert in, in this breathing space um yeah, think about when hard. you're at the weight gym or or if you're trying to lift something you naturally exhale out um that's exactly what pro tennis players are doing every time they hit the ball um i get made fun of a lot my my um grunt is and it's just 
just, I don't know, just naturally that's the noise that I make. A lot of people are like rude. <laughs> a lot of people, you know, make very loud grunting noises. What's the, ah, yeah. uh, from Monica Sellis. Yeah, the bounce, hit. bounce hit. You yeah. guys have read Tim Galloway. I mean, that's that's what Monica Sellis was doing. The IE was bounce hit. It was all just rhythmic, right? And the, the XL, what Scott's talking about, the XL is is releasing tension, right? So like, why do we hear grunting? You know, is there, you know, force being exerted through the ball? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, sometimes it's just a grunt. But it, it's also relieving that muscle tension. So that breath coming out, at, you know, as we're swinging, that's the same thing as in karate or anything else. You know, as, as, as they're, you know, making exhale, making that noise, it's, 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 it's very, very similar. You should be exhaling. Um, Talk about breathing in between points. Cause I know that I think this was part of, um, yeah. so part so, of this question here. Yep. Yeah. So we, you know, just like in yoga or anything else, the awareness of our breath is extremely important, right? And we're able to center ourselves. I'm aware of yours right now. <laughs> That's pretty good. Ha. You're able to center yourself and stay calm. You can control your nerves through your breath. All right. So this piece is really big. We don't think about it a lot in matches. And it's the same way. Like, think, think of it this way. Have you ever been hammering a nail that like, you just couldn't find a stud or maybe it was, you're holding your breath. And you're doing it for hours. Like that horrible tension headache you get. You're growing your drill. You're holding your breath. We do that on court too. And, and that's not where we're going to find optimal performance. So step one is be aware of your breath. What is happening? All right. So let's say that I'm super nervous, right? Like I'm, 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 I want to slow things down, right? Like I want to, I want to make sure that I'm breathing in through the nose, exhaling through the mouth, and I want to make sure that I'm breathing in through my diaphragm. If you're not sure how to breathe in through your diaphragm, simply take your hands, put it on your lower back, and fill your lower back up with your breath. So you're breathing in through your nose, out through your mouth, or the other way around? Yeah, breathing in through the nose. I think right? about, I mean, maybe it's because I now have an almost three-year-old, but think about what you tell somebody, uh, particularly a child, if they're really worked up, deep breaths. Yeah deep breaths or somebody who's having a panic attack, right? Yeah. You can do the same thing. Nervousness and tennis is an emotion. People that think that Federer and Nadal, when they go out there, aren't nervous. You've lost your minds. Like we, we just understand how to cope with what the nervousness does to our body. When I play tennis and I get nervous, I know for a fact, I'm going to start squeezing really tight and I know that I'm going to start freezing with my legs. So I'm not going to fix the fact that I'm nervous. I'm still going to be nervous, but I know that. So I start to focus on really moving my feet around a lot and really relaxing my hands. And then what happens is I start to play well. And as you start to play well, the nerves don't go away, but they certainly improve, right? They certainly yeah. release a little bit for you. So well, and then this to your that that point, the breath also works the other way, right? Maybe you're flat. Maybe right. you don't have enough energy. Speed right? up. Speed up the breathing, right? Start working. I'm not asking you to hyperventilate, but breathe, <laughs> speed it up, <laughs> right? Yeah, we want blood circulating. We want to be breathing. Speed it up <laughs> and start building some energy into what you're doing. So that, that's a really, really good question because breath is absolutely everything in tennis. Cool. All right, guys. I'm going to go to our Facebook and YouTube channel now. So you've got the chat. You're on a little bit of a delay. I've got a few questions in here that I saw earlier that we'll get to. If you have any questions and you're still hanging out right now and you want us to answer them, um, feel free to throw them in here and we will do the best we can to get to you. Um, <laughs> David uh, says you might say Nate's coaching is a breath of fresh air. Yeah. <laughs> you might say David. that. And you might not, David. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, all right. Let's see here. Um, do, do, do. All right. So Arthur, I'm probably butchering your last name here, man. I'm sorry. I think it's Todras. Um, what if the returner hits a lob over your partner? You're further away from the shot if you serve from the alley. So I'll field this one because this was the instruction that I gave. So. Yep. We we're talking about this situation where so Arthur's back here serving. I'm telling Arthur he wants it inside out forehand so he can stand all the way in the doubles alley. He's saying, well, when I serve here, a lob is going to go up over my partner's head and, and I'm going to be further away from it. And the answer to that is yes, you definitely are. And you've got a way whether you're more comfortable running down a ball like this and getting a forehand ground stroke, your partner's going to switch. So you're getting a forehand ground stroke that could be going down the line to a player at the baseline, or maybe they've come up to the net. Um, or 
you know, signing up for a cross court backhand rally. And again, I'm not saying that it's incorrect to stand here. I'm just saying, I know if you're right-handed, you're signing up for a cross court backhand rally, Arthur. So, um, it's a decision you've got to make. If that's happening a lot, you may want to make that adjustment. But what I would say is don't worry about something that hasn't happened yet. So if, if you're thinking, man, my forehand's way better. I want to be in this inside out forehand rally. Serve from here. If over and over again, you're starting to see, you know, this ball come over your partner's head and it's becoming a problem, then I would start to adjust because that's our new problem. That's more pressing than being in a cross court backhand rally. So I hope, uh, I hope that helps. Um, I'm just going to read through some of these. Paul Levinsky was saying the hot seat. We were talking about that earlier. Indeed. Brian, thank you for the kind words. This is great. Kent, good to see you. Amy Hatfield, what's going on? I'm just trying to find the questions. Sorry. It was PLR and Zoo. They're in Virginia Beach because I they say I needed this last night at Linhaven Middle. If you're still uh, still watching. Reveal your identity. You know, P L R N Zoo. Lynn Haven that Middle, means. man. That's it's some old stomping grounds. So those courts are always busy. That's the Ramel. That's the Ramel group because they're playing out there on Monday nights now. So somebody in Ramel's were, group. I thought they were Princess Anne. Oh, you might. You might be right. Oh, there you go. Your father, Dwight Bowling, is here. What up, dude? He says good it's info for us old guys with limited movement. Um, let's see. Da, 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 da. Yeah, Marcel um, mentioned that it seems like it might be tougher to defend the lob with this. Uh, that was earlier on in the live stream. I think since then we've probably covered the solution to that. But uh, Marcel, if you do still have questions there, let me know. Um, Blaze99 from Mount Carmel High School in California. What's going on? Goober Bob, hello. Um, <laughs> Ken, thank you. Uh, I agree with you. I'm digging this TV setup. Uh, Erica, thank you as well. All uh, right, Linda, thank you for the kind words. All right, here's a question. Sorry. Um, I am a lefty. If I have a good serve to my backhand in the deuce court, I either angle. Oh, this is a statement. Never mind. Sorry, Colin, statement loud and clear. This is why I only talk to our plus members because they're very, they're very direct and know exactly what they want to say. <laughs> Okay, here we go. Amy Hatfield would like to know, how far should you move inside on the serve? I always serve from the tram line. The tram line. I think that you're referring to the devil's alley. Gotcha. How far? Amy, where are you uh, Where are you messaging us from? How far should you move inside on going the serve? The tram line, I'm going, yeah. British? Yeah. I don't understand the question. Do you understand the question? Say one more time. How far should you move inside? on the serve when you're returning serve yeah maybe amy i'm going to give you because you're on a, but I'm a minute and a half 45 second delay i'm going to give you one chance uh to type in quickly <laughs> what what it is that you're looking for uh i've just learned you're from columbus georgia so we were not even close oh, well, yeah well, um gonna be far yeah there. provide us a little clarification there and, and, and we'll hook you up um in the meantime a couple of you have asked for this link one more time let me copy and paste it yeah so again guys all this double stuff that we're covering is, is just some tidbits from this course we are selling for 75 percent off until midnight pacific time tonight so if you want to grab that there's the link um okay so she's saying i'm just inside the alley line maybe a foot amy are you talking about returning serve i that, that you would have to be so she's saying. <laughs> yeah, otherwise, that would be a that, huge that, football. Yeah, I'm just inside the alley line. So yeah, we had sort of talked about this um, earlier in in the live stream, right? Where you're going to use your outside pinky toe, the intersection of the single sideline in, in the baseline is sort of a point of reference for starters. And then again, if you're playing somebody with a much weaker serve, you'll slide up the single sideline. If you're playing somebody with a much bigger serve, you'll back way up. Um, if you're playing somebody who's just hitting a bunch of slice serves up the tee, maybe you'll shift over a couple steps. Um, I like to do this a lot. If you're playing somebody who just hasn't shown that they can hit a really good serve out wide, I'll start to cheat over, particularly, um, particularly on the deuce side so that I can give myself more guaranteed forehands. So, yeah, I mean, again, you'll, you'll start with 
this position with your outside pinky toe on the intersection of the baseline and the single sideline, and then just adjust based on what you're seeing. Hopefully that helps. Um, Peter Braveman, and it is 925. Um, my wife is going to divorce me if we don't wrap this up by 930. So I will close it out with this question from Peter Braveman. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. If you have a lefty partner and you are right-handed, which side of the court do you recommend each of us plays? Forehands in the middle or forehands in the alley? So that's a fantastic question. Yeah. I want to hear your opinion first just in case they differ, and then I'll give you mine. So – I think it's completely – there is no right answer. That's the It's it's completely up to the individuals. When, when you – for a while there, um, you know, we were seeing the Spaniards, you know, Nadal, Verdasco, uh, Lopez. They were playing doubles, and they were being quite successful against the Bryan brothers and a few others, and they were working through this combination. You know, Nadal with the lefty outside, Verdasco with the righty on the outside – and their forehands are just so big and penetrating, they were able to take over the court. Now, what the disadvantage here is, they both have backhand volleys through the middle. And we know that in doubles, middle solves the riddle. We want a lot of balls going through the middle of the court low. So it puts them at a disadvantage. Forehands are so big, they weren't really worried about what they were doing at net. Now, on the other side of it, if you switch them, whoops. All right, so now they have their forehands in the middle really efficient up at net, right? But now they have their backhands on the outside of the court. For return um, to serve. For return to serve, yeah. yeah. So I played with a, a lefty through college, and I always had the lefty on the ad court, and I played on the deuce court. And, and granted, we were a little bit weaker through the middle of the court, but we were aware of that. So we were a little bit more aggressive with our positioning. But this is where we went on the return game. I mean, I thought it was – phenomenal having him over there to convert the big points with the forehand on the outside of the court when righties are predominantly hitting kickers. Hard to, hard to talk out of that. You know, that's a big one. Yeah, it, it kind of – I don't disagree with Nate at all. I just think it's a little – it's situational, right? So, like, I'm right-handed. I'm real comfortable with my backhand out wide, and I prefer to play on the ad side as a right-handed player. If I've got a lefty that feels the same about their backhand out wide, then we can both get up to the net. And like Nate was saying earlier, the large majority of the balls really doing damage should be going through the middle of the court, and that's two forehand volleys in the middle of the court. Um, I think that's tough to beat. Uh, but the, the actual answer that I always give here is who is the more clutch player? That's why I went on the ad side because they're taking all the big points. Yeah. So um, I know that has nothing to do with left or right-handed, but it, but it is something you need to consider. Um, like if you've got a 5-0 and a 4-5 playing together, I'm putting the 5-0 on the ad side every single time if they're, if they're more clutch under pressure. 30, 40, add in, add out. Those are all the big high pressure points. 30 all is not nearly as scary as 30, 40. Um, deuce is not nearly as scary as add out, yeah. right? So, well, and I think even for like a righty lefty combo, I hear all the time, like, um, well, we play this side because, you know, we have our forehands in the middle, or I want her forehand, his forehand in the middle. You got to get the ball back and play before you yeah. worry about bodies, <laughs> right. Right? right? So, whatever your best return is, that should be focus number one because. If you're sacrificing your return game to get the volley that you want, you kind of put in the cart in front of the horse. Right? For sure. For sure. I'll throw one more out here because Tony, you've intrigued me. Tony wants to know the number one success tip for a junior 14 year old player in doubles and in singles. In doubles, it's get to the net. And in singles, it's put three balls in the court before you try something silly because most 14 year old players will beat themselves if you just give them the chance. And you're, what was it? Did we just release that? Was that the single strategy and tactics? That was your, I mean, and this is so simple. Three. Well, and not just the rule three about what you talked about playing up, you know, down the line. Make sure, yeah. Tony, oh, wow. you play from position, all right? If you're. Yeah, hold on. I'll set you up here. Let's get all your little excess homies off the screen here. You're playing singles now. There you go. Never know. I could do that. Yeah, that quick, I did didn't it. You? I did it. All right. So, Tony, what happens a lot of times in singles, man, we're going to super bonus here, aren't we? All right, so what happens a lot of times, and this is where we see one of the biggest mistakes, this player hits a ball that puts you behind the baseline over here, and you can see, like, well behind the baseline. You're almost off the court. We can go there, right? You're, you're, you're deep. This player recovers from an appropriate position from being pulled out cross court. They're not going all the way there because the likelihood is that it's going cross court. But the majority of the juniors that I work with, they see all of this. Is this right? Can you hook me up? They see all of this space and the coach, but it was open. I didn't get that. 
Hey, Could you try again? Hey Siri. <laughs> hey Siri, <laughs> thanks for chiming into our live stream. <laughs> like our what in the actual? <laughs> but so this player is anticipating it. They can see the down the line, right? And so from here, if this ball isn't a winner, they've moved over. And guess what? You're now running all the way over here, and you've managed to put yourself in defense. So when should you go down the line? All right. Go over this real quick. Super, super bonus. Super bonus. So when should you go down the line? When you have your feet inside the line, inside the court. At the court, inside the court. I think we just, we just released a YouTube video on this too. So check that out if you can, Tony. This player hits a ball that's a little bit weaker. It allows you to move up, all right? And then you're attacking the ball down the line. You've earned the position. You're closer to the net. The ball is gonna get there faster. Then you can attack down the line. And maybe you follow it in, or you set up your forehand on this side of the court. But don't change direction from behind the baseline if that is the theme. Yep, so Tony, in summary, for doubles, man, seriously, tell, um, tell that junior to get up to the net, because players, like we said, freak out. And in singles, it's basically play offense from offensive positions and know when to play defense from defensive positions. Simplified rule of three, put the ball on the court three times before you try something crazy. And if you're going to try something crazy, make sure it's when you're in position. Okay. Guys, it is 931 on the dot. We are going to shut it down. Thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. Um, we do do these once a month. I just said doo-doo. <laughs> um, if you are a plus member, you'll have access to the Zoom calls, Christopher, David, everybody else that was in plus. I, I know we've talked your your ears off. I appreciate you two sticking around so long. And to the 76 of you that are still here an hour and a half deep on Facebook and YouTube, so cool, we appreciate man. you guys. Yeah, Check out that doubles course uh, if you haven't already. If you're not in the player court membership for six bucks a month, you're really messing up. So go here do that. Go to, go to playercourt.com and sign up if you haven't. I'm not going to sell you anything <laughs> on a Tuesday night. Um, guys, thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you guys next time. Take care, everybody. Well, uh, we really have that many people in the whole time. <laughs>